Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and I'm with Audrey Waters, and we're actually in room 6A at the San Diego Convention Center, which will be Social EdCon tomorrow. That's right. Part of the ISTE conference. That's right, the opening, the opening event. I think the one that um, most people are arriving <laughs> earlier and earlier <laughs> to attend. <laughs> yeah, although we've been in, encroached upon by Discovery and some others who who discovered that that Saturday is a good Nikki. day. I know. <laughs> Anyway, anything that gets people here, actually it's really fun to see people arriving here Friday and enjoying the weekend together before the I think that that's actually one of the really important things, and this is one of the things that I noticed about my own travel plans this year, is that I was thinking I must arrive early, although I'm here for other reasons, but I wanted to arrive early, and then really once the exhibit hall opens, I want to get out of Dodge. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so your first post is actually on ISTE. Yeah. You call it uh, Looking Back, Looking Forward. Uh, you have some history with ISTE. I do have history with ISTE. And I have history before, before I worked for ISTE. I worked for ISTE for not quite two years. Um, when I very first um, moved to Oregon in 1996, my first job in Eugene was working at the University of Oregon for Paul Katz, who ran the conference services department at the U of O. Um, working um, to run registration and exhibits for what was then NEC. So the last time I was in San Diego was in 1998 for NEC 98. And welcome back for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a beautiful spot. It is a beautiful spot. Gorgeous weather. Okay, so um, I want to give a little credit where credit is due. Yes. We held the first EduBloggerCon uh, six years ago in Atlanta, and it was a gathering of educational bloggers. and. ISTE has supported this kind of undercover, uh, we call it unplugged, but it's sort of a shadow conference within the conference of social media types and bloggers mm -hmm. and the like. And I think that was actually pretty thoughtful and forward thinking of them to be supportive of that. I think that it's interesting to think about the ways and the things that have changed over the years and the things that have remained the same, for better or for worse. I mean, it's, I think sometimes we, we act as though somehow change is always good and staying the same is always bad. Um, but I think that, I think that the, the conference has done a great job of making, making space, I mean, and literally making space for people to connect offline. I mean, this is, I mean, the reason that I, I would say that I continue to come to this conference is this is, I think, the time I know when I can see offline friends that I've had now for, well, <laughs> a long time in, in education technology. And I think that the, the conference has made, has made a space made a space for that in terms of the program and in just in terms of thinking about how to, you know, this is a mammoth building that we're in right now. And so how do you organize it spatially so that people feel comfortable um, in a crowd of 20,000 people finding time to sit down and have conversations with their friends or with new friends too. There's a unique element to this conference because half of the attendees on any given year are there for the first time. Right. So, so there's this really sort of the other half crowd. Are exhibitors. Right. The other half are exhibitors, <laughs> and then there's this few hundred of us who've <laughs> <laughs> been coming for the last 20 years or so. Right. But I actually think that it, that's, that's a well-done balance yes. that, it, that we can come and see our group and our audience. Yes. You do make a list of the differences between 1998 and 2012. I thought this was really interesting. I was sort of poking around, thinking about, trying to remember um, what, what happened in 98. I was trying to think of who was the keynote speaker. Of course, my first conference was NEC 97, and that was when Bill Gates was the keynote speaker. So I was racking my brain to think who was the keynote speaker in 98. So I went to the ISTE website, and I found this wonderful list of what the themes were from the conference. And I was really struck by the fact that we really are dealing with a lot of the same issues still 14 years later, which is sort of how do we get these tech, like literally how do we sort of physically have infrastructure in schools to get these technologies into the classroom? How do we work with professional development to support teachers? And um, it actually felt it was sort of this strange moment where we're like, wow, very little. Or I mean, the, some of the t tools have changed, the names of the tools, we don't really worry about hypermedia web pages too or much or making CD-ROMs with our students anymore. But um, it actually felt as though a lot of the same issues are, are the same. So is there a lesson there? I mean, I think that the obvious lesson is that 
that would be one that, that schools are slow to change and slow to adapt and slow to adopt technology. But I think that the, that the other lesson might be that these, are, these perhaps are ongoing struggles. I mean, I think that every time we have new teachers, new kids in the classroom, new tools, we do have to think carefully about what does it mean to use them. And I think that I'm not sure that we can sort of stick a pin in the ground and say from here forward we will always have technology and it will always be used wisely and everyone will have access. I think that this is clearly an ongoing, an ongoing issue. One of the things that occurs to me every time I go to an ed tech conference and it's the sort of the mothership of ed tech for K-12 is I ask myself the question, should we actually be having a separate educational technology conference or should there be should technology sort of be infused in the conferences around the subject areas? Yeah, I mean, I think that this comes back to thinking a post that I wrote a couple of weeks ago based on what Bud Hutton said is that is ed tech a shorthand for something else? And maybe we should be talking about those things. And I think that that's, that's this other issue too is that when we're not just talking about how do you, you know, how do you do a better job using, I don't know, PowerPoint in your classroom, and really th th these questions of how do you do the best possible job teaching science, teaching writing, uh, teaching math, and, and those, aren't, those aren't something that you can sort of answer once and then never have to return to again at, a, at an education conference. But I do think that, you know, I do think that this question of what is the role of the tools themselves, the technology themselves, is something that I would rather see addressed by educators than necessarily just dictated by the folks on the exhibit floor. So let's get to that, yeah, right? because that, it, it, this is a conference that draws a lot of people who care a lot about technology, yeah. and the exhibit floor tends to be sort of the best and worst of humanity in <laughs> one place, right? <laughs> Indeed it does. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, what are your sort of normal complaints? I mean, what the crowd? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that one of the things that is always really striking to me when you walk on the exhibit floor is the amount of money that's just been spent in that process. And I think that that's an, it's a fairly easy critique to make about this conference in general is that you spend any time in the exhibit floor and it's, you're overwhelmed by the amount of money that goes into wooing potential customers. And that's, I think that can be a little off-putting, particularly since if you look at some of the, the big exhibits, they aren't necessarily the ones that you think, wow, this is really the most exciting way to sort of help, help students reach their potential. Um, and so I think that the, exhibit, the exhibits are a challenging place to run through, but I'm excited because I'm going to run through and ask them all sorts of tough questions and see how many uh -huh. people I can. You can have an Audrey exhibit floor test. Yes, I've actually, I'm going to make sure I get um, my boyfriend a pass. We're going to team <laughs> up and we've, we've, got a, we've got a plan to ask a specific technology question about their, particularly about their data, their data portability and what they're doing to help support and connect to other systems. So we're going to see how many of these companies on the exhibit floor are actually thinking about um, being open and sharing with their data instead of having closed, closed silos. I see a YouTube video in the making <laughs> as you ask these hard questions. And then I'm going to see how many pens I can collect. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I, I, um, one of the things that's really noticeable to me about the exhibit floor is that whenever you see a crowd, then you know it's a giveaway. Right. And that feels kind of weird to me that the that the draw and the attraction is the the, the giveaway, stuff. the stuff. I mean, I think that that's I think that that that's what this, this that's what actually one of the other things that feels very odd about the the show floor is that I mean many of the people who attend this conference I would say are classroom teachers, and yet the the exhibitors I think are pitching pitching devices that a classroom teacher has very little say in and what, what actually appears in his or her classroom. I mean, things like smart boards. A, a teacher, an individual teacher isn't going to make a decision to have a smart board. That's something that's going to happen at the school or district level. And so I think that the, the, sa like the sales techniques always feel sort of at odds with the actual attendees. And then there is this whole sort of tchotchke thing that feels very, very weird as well. So this is the equivalent of advertising unhealthy cereal to children with the mandate of their parents? <laughs> I liked that analogy. Okay, so you are interested in seeing if any startups are on the floor. Yes, I mean, and I think that this is this other, this other problem as well, is that exhibits, I mean, and I say this having had some time working behind the scenes to put, actually physically put on this conference, is that 
it's really expensive. Having, having an exhibit at a conference costs a lot of money. I mean, it costs money to sort of rent a table, to get power, to truck in displays, let alone to sort of print up t-shirts. And that's something that startups that don't have a lot of cash, I have to wonder if that's the best way for them to spend what are pretty limited resources. But of course, we're seeing so much funding of startups right now, perhaps they'll be here. And that raises some questions too about how disrupt, disruptive there's, how, you know, how disruptive really they will be if they're already participating in these other practices that are much more associated with, you know, the smart board manufacturers and the textbook companies that will be, right. be on the show floor as well. This is actually taking us back a year, at, you know, of conversations that we've had. Yeah. But uh, you could make the argument that a startup that comes and actually really does connect with educators is maybe not a bad model. Totally. And I think that, I mean, I'm actually really interested in seeing the number of startups that I know that are going to be here that aren't exhibiting. And so they're really, uh, they really are interested in making connections, one-to-one um, -one connections with teachers, having a chance to sort of show a teacher and do a, sort of do a demo in a more gorilla-like setting, which is instead of, you know, getting a big booth and sort of putting on this, putting on the circus in order to lure customers to be able to have a more intimate conversation with someone and say, this is what I've built. Do you like it? Will it work? What can I, what can I change? What would make this better? Is this something that you would use? Why not? Let me sort of uh, um, adopt it or adapt, adapt my tool to fit, fit your needs, which isn't something that you tend to hear from textbook companies. No, but there have been some really noticeable players in the uh, tech world who've come to Bloggers Cafe, who've yeah. come to these events and done a really good job. Wikispaces keeps coming well, to I mind. Well, I think that that's a great, that's a great example and I, and I think that, um, uh, I think that, and I don't think Wikispaces exhibit here, do they? No, they just no. come and, right. and actually. And they're participants. I mean, they actually mm -hmm. attend the conference too. It's not, I mean, it isn't as though they're solely here as some sort of insidious marketing campaign, but I think that they really are here because they, that they, particip they participate as a community member and not just as a salesperson. So the next book is going to have to be guerrilla marketing techniques for ed tech <laughs> startups, right? Yes, that's right. But I must say that there are a couple of startups that I'm looking forward to seeing, um, least of which is um, Eric Simons, who was in the, um, in the news recently because he had squatted at, at AOL headquarters. So he's going to be here. Let's oh, hope good. he has a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, or we can come early to the uh, conference center and <laughs> scout the couches. <laughs> That's right. We need to make sure he's actually well taken care of. Um, you're, you have, there are some questions that you want to ask. Yeah. Wither the whiteboard. Right. I really, I mean, I'm very curious. I'm not a fan. I mean, I would say, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the whiteboard. It seems like a very expensive hardware investment for schools to make. A lot of schools have made that investment. But I think that seeing the rise, um, and not just the, sort of the, the spread of sort of the, the consumer technology, of mobile consumer technology, but sort of how has that shifted the argument that these smart, that these companies are going to make? Last time I checked, um, some of ISTE's, you know, biggest sponsors, um, biggest corporate sponsors were the smart board manufacturers. And what happens to them in a world now where we're arguing that each student needs to have their own device? Because really the smart board is the antithesis of that. That raises all kinds of interesting issues about how uh, legitimate activities by commercial companies to sustain their business um, could put them in a position where they're continuing to promote a technology that doesn't actually provide effective value to students. Well, I mean, and I think that that I mean, I think that that's going to be that's something that I'm really interested in seeing. It, like, is it the the sort of marketing that you can sort of sense that some sort of the fear in the marketing that they're going to have to have a bigger booth than ever? more razzmatazz and more sort of more giveaways and are those giveaways iPads. Um, but, I, but I think that it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the smart board companies because I feel as though the tide has changed and no longer are the classroom teachers going to go back to their principals and say, you know what the coolest thing I saw ISTE was was a smart board. I mean, I, maybe someone will, but I, I mean that seems less, less likely than the coolest thing being I saw an iPad app. We know no one's going to go back and say, oh, it was that totally cool open educational resource <laughs> site or this open source product. Yeah, it was this really great open source technology that I saw. I know. I got, a, I got an email today uh, 
actually asking if I would put into writing the talk I gave at O'Reilly on the death of open source in K-12. That's fine. Uh, uh, and I mean, it's, yeah. Really, when we don't do the, we had the open source pavilion, we showed Linux, we did all the stuff. It really kind of went away. Uh, and I, I mean, that is one of the things that I'd like, to, I mean, not just the open source technology, but I, I'm actually curious, too, to see what their responsiveness is about OER. Um, partially, I mean, and not just are there OER opportunities, but how are these companies, how are the textbook companies going to be responding to the ubiquity of, of, of OER as well? What's, sort of what's their pitch when you say, why on earth would I spend money on on this tool when I can find it online, when I can find a high quality, openly licensed tool online. It is likely though that data portability and open APIs are, are going to be being discussed, Maybe. right? Maybe. We're going we're gonna, <laughs> to try to discuss them. I mean, I think that this, this is a question that I, that I very much have for, for, the, for the vendors. And, wh and whether they're sort of some of these older, you know, older textbook companies or not. I mean, I really, I really do want to see what, what they're doing to, to, to recognize that we really have an opportunity now to connect all sorts of systems together. Um, and there really is no excuse to sort of silo off education content, education data into your own private, into your own private tool. Uh, and finally, this whole question of hands-on uh, and, and hands-on activities versus kind of the top-down test driven how many kind of how many hands on how many tinkering companies do you think would be on the show floor I'm not going to think there are going to be many <laughs> I don't think so either I actually I know of one because they actually saw my story and oh. said hey <laughs> make sure you stop by our booth but yeah I mean I don't I don't think there will be many either and I think that that's really I think that that's actually an interesting indication of again the sort of the legacy of this of the exhibit hall at ISTE, which is very different from the maker movement. This is a very different thing from what we saw a couple of weekends ago, which had kids up to their elbows in, right. in sort of messy exploration. And I mean, kids aren't allowed on the show floor, but I mean, I just can't, I don't think, even t you won't even have teachers up to their elbows in messy exploration. I'm having a brainstorm. Okay. Okay, so what if we did a maker day? I think like it's great. we do the SD Unplug, where we have the social ed con. I think that's really important. What if we did a day where actually people could actually bring set up booths, mm -hmm. but it was around the SD event, so that you'd get the audience who were already coming. I think a, I mean I think a, a maker a mini maker fair around SD would be would be great, and I think it's an opportunity for teachers too to um, to spend some time thinking about how can you how can you um, how can you invite making into your classroom because it is a little. I mean, it is a little frightening, particularly if you don't have sort of te technical skills yourself. Um, but I think there are lots of things. I mean, as you see, see at Maker Faire, there are lots of things you can do that actually don't require you to know electrical engineering, for example. You don't actually have to build a computer. I mean, knitting is making. Um, and so there are, there are lots of activities I would love to see showcased that, that highlight, this, you know, highlight all sorts of artistic and scientific explorations that I think that this, this conference is, this conference will stand in stark opposition to the last event that you and I were together at. Right. Well, the, all of this, the Unplugged, is actually based on something called the Fringe Festival, mm -hmm. which is the festival that exists right. outside of the Arts Festival in Edinburgh. Right. And uh, so that would really fit well. I, I think, think we so should too. do it. I think we should too. Okay, so uh, I think finally, we, know people. we do. <laughs> uh, but one of those people is leaving. I know, one of my favorite people. So we need to just sort of wave a flag here, uh, honor somebody that we both really, really like. Right. I mean, and that's, that's Anita McNair, who I think that the, the funny thing about Anita is I'm, I'm not sure that most ISTE attendees or probably the most ISTE members recognize how important she's been to, to the development of ISTE as an organization and particular to ISTE and its publications and but particularly to this conference. I'm not sure how long she's been the conference chair, but it's, um, she really is the person. She's been with ISTE since, like, literally since the very beginning, since Dave Morrison came up with an idea at a party that we should, that we should have an organization to sort of um, recognize computing and education. And so she's retiring um, after this event. And I know that she's one of the, she's been, she was a joy to work with when I worked at ISTE, and I think she will really be missed. So uh, 
Anita has always shepherded and cared for me very well in all these mm -hmm. sort of uh, crowd activities. Why aren't we talking about Don? I don't know. That's a that's a good question. I mean, I think that Don is Don is um, Don is leaving as well. I don't know. I mean, I think I never worked. I mean, it's one thing I never worked. I never worked with Don. Don was in D.C. I was in Eugene. Um, Anita's in Eugene as well. And I think that Don always felt like he was an ex he was a um, an external facing person, sort of making making relationships outside of the ed tech community, making relationships in other countries making relationships with sort of officials, whereas Anita sort of felt like the go-to person. Like if you had a question about a tool or a person or a, a, a trend or a theme, you could ask Anita and she would know the entire history and she would know the three scholars that had researched it and the three best tools and at least half a dozen teachers who tried it for better or for worse in the classroom. And I've never thought of Don as a person with that sort of knowledge. So, uh, um, I know that was sort of a, a, <laughs> uh, a hard question to ask, but I've never really gotten to know Don. Yeah. I've been here six years and, and uh, I've done a number of activities that are sort of very visible at mm -hmm. the show. Um, and I felt this, so maybe there's almost a way in which that Don and Anita kind of represent the two different sides of the conference. Yeah. Kind of the corporate advertising, commercial side and right. the kind of grassroots teacher side. Yeah, I think that that's probably a good point. I think that, you know, I think that Don, Don's role has been as um, sort of the, the political, the political face of, of IFTI and, and Anita's very much has been the practical, the practical side. I mean, Anita's the person who makes, thing, makes things happen. I think that Don is the person who gives the speeches about what has happened. So can an organization, I mean, is it just an inherent difficulty of an organization that it gets to a certain size where it has to worry about its perpetuation more than the message? Because it seems as though we haven't really seen ISTE as a, an active participant in some of these conversations where you would say, or I would say, where, where are they? I want you to be arguing on this particular side. And is it just an inherent dilemma of growth that you cease to be able to be kind of on the, on the edge? I think, it's, I think it is. Partially that, but I also think it's the rise of social media in which I think, you know, decades ago when ISTE was founded, it's the idea of having a membership organization that had both a professional development component and this lobbying component, right? I mean, it, that's why Don is in D.C. is that he and Hillary, um, they have a small staff in D.C. that are sort of help lobby Congress for for ed tech funding and ed tech ed tech related legislation and I think that I think the rise of social media has given the ISTE members a voice in a way that having a membership organization um, doesn't feel perhaps doesn't feel as necessary as an or as an, or as crucial as it did and, and both for the lobbying and the PD as well I mean I think that and I think that this is a crisis not just for not just for ISTE, but for all sorts of organizations like that that used to be the way in which we'd network. I mean, ISTE was for a long time the one time a year where you'd get to sort of not not just see people face to face, but talk to people. And now, we, you know, we can talk to people all the time. You can send some of these luminaries a message on Twitter and they'll respond to you right away. And so it's not, it's not as though you sort of have to come to ISTE to sort of see what Gary Steger has to say. You can see what Gary Steger has to say in real time on Twitter. I don't think there are many ISTE attendees who actually come to see Gary Steger, you unfortunately. Don't think <laughs> there should be more. <laughs> there should be more. Okay, so uh, Richard Byrne. I think Gary thinks that too, though. So, well, so um, this is an interesting thing that comes up with these conferences, which every once in a while you meet somebody who says, I never get accepted to speak at that conference. Uh -huh. So um, uh, Richard Byrne says, you know, he's not coming this year. I, I never get accepted to speak at ISTE. There is a degree to which these conferences also reflect kind of an old school very, networking. They very much so. They do. And I think that that's, I mean, again, these are the things that feel really in flux in terms of, in terms of organizational power. Um, the people who, again, you know, I think back to the folks who I know from 1998 they will be here. I mean, they will be here, and they're still sort of very much involved with um, with ISTE, the organization. And they aren't necessarily the people that I turn to on Twitter when I have a question. I mean, Richard's a great example. 
they aren't the people that I turn to on social media. They're folks who I think did well in those in those old older organizational structures, but perhaps for a variety of reasons they aren't they aren't the people that are paid that we're paying attention to in a, in a world of Twitter. So I know I'm really drilling down here on this, but it's a fun conversation. Yeah. What about women? So that's one of the complaints I often hear is that women are underrepresented as keynote speakers and as as being highly visible at these kind of conferences. No, this is. I think that this is a really. I was actually thinking about this as again as I went through and looked the, this web this web page that lists all of ICSI's that lists all of ICSI. <laughs> We've got a little bit of. Uh, Background noises there configuring the room, but that's part of the, that's part of the flavor part of, the, of this right. podcast as you're hearing the <laughs> preparations at ISTE. Um, but the, I think that I was looking through the list of, uh, of keynote speakers in the past and the keynote speakers even for this, for this weekend and, or this week and looking at the, the absolute domination of the men's names versus women name, women's names. And this is, I think it's, I think it's a question in technology in particular. I think that um, the technology industry tends to be one that, for lots of reasons, highlights men's accomplishments and, and tends to sort of invite men. And it feels even more out of place in something like education, which still is a predominantly female occupation, a class for classroom teachers at least, is a predominantly female op um, occupation. You know. So I, defini I definitely notice the fact that you find um, a lot of, I don't know what the ratio of male to female attendees um, are here. I don't actually know if ISTE tracks that. I think they must track that in terms of member numbers. But I do, I do often notice that the folks who are on stage speaking do tend to be men. And some of the names that we, you know, that we frequently associate with sort of ed tech gurus, for better or for worse, are also ma male men's names. I don't know very many women who are in that role. Interesting. Um, okay, well, we'll move on, but thank you for that. <laughs> so, uh, Code Now. Yes. $10 million in funding. Well, for Code Academy. I'm sorry, Code Academy, $10 million. Yes. But you want to talk about Code I do. I want to talk now. about Code Now. Yeah. Uh, I woke up uh, to the news that Code Academy had raised $10, $10 million. And the, the story that I wrote about Code Academy when they raised their first round of funding is the most popular story on my blog of all times. And I. And I thought I should say something about a ten, like ten million dollars is a lot of money. It for deserves a, multiples of your original it does, greed. It does because I think that this, you know, the, many of my think complaints um, still, I think, are still completely valid, and I think that this is still a company that has no demonstrable plan for making money. And you know, I always want to ask these questions when we see a startup raise so much money. It's raised twelve and a half million dollars now, and it has no clear, no clear way to, to make money. Um, but, but I happened to get an email from Ryan Seashore, who I've, I've blogged about um, his nonprofit Code Now before, but he shared a really cool story with me, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to, like, Code, Code Academy can be, you know, it can have its praises sung in the tech press. I'm really more interested in what Ryan is doing with actually no money. Um, in making a difference in the lives of um, some Washington, D.C. teams. And uh, he, he, he told me a story about one of the students who had never, had no experience with programming, took his winter, um, his winter boot camp session, and he and a couple of high school friends built a video game, and they won, they won uh, the, entertainment, uh, the Entertainment Software Association STEM Video Game Challenge. So this is a person that had that has now realized that what he's meant to do with his life, a uh, young African-American kid, has, has decided that he's, he's going to be a software engineer, he's going to be a game maker. And that's huge. And that's a profoundly important transformation that I just don't think, um, I don't think that we always pay close attention to how, how really are we going to make a difference in kids' lives that can't just log on to the web and teach themselves to code. And that's the sort of promise of Code Academy. And I think that it, 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 that promise doesn't recognize how we need to provide all sorts of support and infrastructure and mentorship and, and ongoing support for kids. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I wanted to, to, to tell the story about this, and I also wanted to draw attention to the fact that 
Code now doesn't have enough money to offer its summer program, and so they're they're raising money on Indiegogo. Yeah, so the whole startup mentality is much more in harmony with this idea of authentic offerings that really mm -hmm. make a difference. And that is a great story. He was a junior in high yeah, school and discovers all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, and he gets his first computer. I mean, that's one of the thing, great things, too, is the kids who participate in this actually get a computer. And um, for, many, I mean, for most of these kids, this, this is their first computer. Uh, they, they have no access. I mean, they would have access to technology at school or after school programs, but they don't have a computer at home. And now he has, he has a computer. Uh, um, how do we help the unsung heroes get the kind of recognition and feedback that really seems to be missing in a world of commercialization and sort of high stakes gambling on a tech venture. I think that this is the, this is the piece that also really stuck in, stuck in my craw over this is that um, the professor at Georgia Tech tweeted, he said that... Um, when he tweeted, startups raise yeah, money to democratize something... They're really commercializing it. I mean, and that's the rhetoric that we're hearing, not just from Code Academy, but from Udacity and Coursera as well. Right? Their promise is that they're going to democratize education by putting it on the web and making it free. And all of these companies have raised, you know, over 10 million, each of them have raised well over $10 million each. And so at some point, there has to be a payday for those investors. And so at some point, there has to, commercial interests have to kick in. And those interests, I don't think, are necessarily going to be the interests of um, minority youth, of youth who, of, of kids who aren't represented in the tech industry right now, and that's pretty much anyone who's not a white male or perhaps an Asian male. And so I think it's really important to find ways to highlight the good work that folks do. And there are other folks outside of Code Now. I mean, there are groups like Black Girls Code, um, Girl Develop It. There are, there are groups that focus on face-to-face -face instruction, mentorship, spending some time to show, um, to show kids that, that uh, a future as a software developer, or just a future as a, as a web literate or coding literate person, is something that's possible. Okay, terrific. Um, the University Now and the Mythologies of Higher Ed. This was fascinating. Yeah. So, so where are adult learners going? Well, adult learners, adult learners are, you know, this is, this is a really, I think, an interesting moment for, for higher education, and that's why I frame this in terms of the mythologies of higher education, is that, that um, particularly at this moment of an economic downturn where people are out of work and they decide to return to college in order for a better job or uh, other job opportunities, retraining, or they know that they need a, a college degree in order to sort of get a job. And it used to be that they would go to community college, or perhaps they would enroll in their local or in a public, a local public university. But nowadays, they go to not, they go to for profit. Um, uh, although adults, adults enrolled in college is on the rise. Adults enrolled in not for profit colleges is on the decline. Which says that they're going. They to are the for profit going. colleges. They're going for the for profit colleges, and I think you can say, well, perhaps. You know, that this feeds into this notion that the for-profits are doing some predatory marketing, that they're um, luring people into college that aren't, that aren't sort of in academically qualified to be there. Um, but I think, it's, I think we also need to recognize that the for-profits are meeting these students' needs, right? They're offering online classes. They're offering classes that recognize that if you work a nine-to-five job, you can't show up at Thursday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to take your math requirement. You have to find an alternative. And the for-profits are doing a lot better job of that than, than public universities are. Okay, so myth number one was from Gene Wade who said, you don't, you know, the myth is that you have to go into debt. Right. And so the, the university now model, so, this, so again, this company raised $17.5 million this week. Um, it's a for-profit. It's an accredited school, although interestingly, they don't, they're not a Title IV school, which means they aren't, you, students aren't eligible aid. for financial aid. But their business model is sort of somewhat akin to the Western Governors University um, in, insofar as it's competency-based. But you pay $199 a month. You can sign up for as many classes as you want. And you get a credit. You get a credit for those classes when you pass a test. 
So it does. So it's not about seat time. It's not about semesters per se. It's about this quote competency-based education. I actually really liked this I idea. Think it's a inter I think it is an interesting idea, and I think that it. I think that I'm. On one hand, I'm really happy to see experimentations, particularly around around the for-profit model. Again, this is. You know, I mean, and one of the interesting things I don't know if I even wrote about in my story, but with university now, you can you can actually sign up and participate, or you can you have access to all the materials, and you can actually um, learn and access the, the content without actually signing up and being a paying student. So conceivably, you could spend some time learning prepping, prepping and then register pay your $199 a month when you're ready, when you feel you're ready to, 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 to take the test. And I think there's a lot to be, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a model that MITx is exploring, right? Give the content away for free, but if you'd like a certificate that says you passed, you're going to pay us money. So, I mean, you know, University Now isn't, isn't using a model that's unheard of in the public university space. Um, and I think that there's a lot of interesting potential there. There was so much of interest in the story. Number one, that they're accredited. Yes. Number two, 199 a month. I, I should have penciled that out, but we're getting, we're, this is a pretty low dollar amount. It's a really low dollar amount, and I think it's particularly, you know, particularly if you're a student who knows, you know absolutely what you need to do in order to, I mean, Again, you know, this is why I frame this in terms of the mythologies of higher education too. This, this is this is not for students that aren't really sure what they want at college, which is I think the stereotypical at least 18-year-old that enters college. Like, I don't know what I want to be. I don't know what I want to major in. I'm going to sort of take some classes and then eventually. I'm at a <laughs> eventually, party. I'm going to go to a sporting event. Right. This is not. This passage. is not that experience. This is a, this is this is an opportunity for someone who knows that if you know. Who knows that they they're at X sort of level of position at their job, and unless they get a degree, whether it's a bachelor's or a master's, they'll never get a promotion. They'll never get a promotion to the next level. So, say if you work in social work, for example, you know that you're probably it's not that you want to get a degree in you know um, in French or in business. You know you need a you know you need a master's degree in social work if you're going to get to the next level. So it's a pretty deliberate, targeted um, class offerings for students who know what they need. And again, you know, the the for profits are serving this they are serving this need much much better than the, than the not for profits are. I had a fascinating discussion with the woman at the Phoenix University who's mm -hmm. over the learning analytics and mm -hmm. the learning system, and I actually was very impressed. Uh, I read this story soon after having read the one about um, Code Academy and the ten million dollars, right? And, and this, the lead in this story was the $17 million. Mm -hmm. And I thought, why is it I feel differently about the money here than I felt when you wrote the story on Code Canada? Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, uh, and I, I, I feel differently about this story, too, because I, I will say that two of my favorite investors, in fact, I would say, the, uh, I could count <laughs> two investors that I have a lot of respect for, and that's Greta Klein and Mitch Kapoor who are the initial investors in the university now. And I think that their investment philosophy is in, um, they are in this sort of, these companies are sort of in the in-between space and that they are for-profit companies, but they really do have a social good element to them. And so I think that university now is part of that gesture and like how do we provide, how do we provide something for students that really do need a degree and that can't otherwise, can't afford it and shouldn't have to go into debt for it. But I think that there are still lots of questions to be raised about, uh, about again, the mythologies of higher education. And is a degree, like what is this fascination over a degree? And is a degree enough? Um, and is a degree from a university that no one's heard of before, that's a for-profit university, is that going to really be the thing that's sufficient to lift someone to the, to the next level? And that was one of the reasons why I reached out to, um, to, to Tressy, who's a, who's a PhD student, and asked her some questions about how she would respond to this. And I thought that her, her response was, was really brilliant, I thought, which is one of the things that these for-profits aren't providing students are these networks to help them 
make the make the next move. Is it really a, a college degree isn't sufficient, or it isn't always sufficient? What matters is having um, having these sort of connected networks, and are you going to participate in it? Are you going to gain the social capital from a for-profit degree, even if it's $199 a month? Is that is that really enough to get you to give you social to give you social or professional mobility? So the myth there is the myth of meritocracy, Completely. and she's saying it's not actually a meritocracy. Right. But interestingly enough, for those adult learners, it actually probably is a meritocracy. I think that I mean I think that this is a I mean I think that this is why this is a such a a difficult and I think I think I loved the story. She was like a really rich story because it, I think it really does. We sort of when we crack open, what is it that we want out of higher ed? What is it that we expect these institutions, for profit or not for profit, what are we expecting them to do? Are we expecting them to do job training? And why? Like, why are universities doing job training? Why aren't jobs doing <laughs> job training? Do we expect it to be a a period in a 18-year-old's life where they get to experiment um, experiment with their own identity? Is, is that the role of, of higher education? And I think that things like the university now really demonstrate that there are so many different meanings from what we want and what we expect a college to do that, um, that I think that, and there are lots of, lots of ways in which um, the, the public institutions and, and, and private, private four-year colleges as well really aren't, they aren't meeting, they aren't meeting people's needs and, you know, what then? It was hard for me to read the story without thinking of another mythology, mm -hmm. and that is the sort of uh, equivalent of degrees to lifetime earnings. Yes. And it felt to me like that's also something worth exploring. Well, I mean, and I, and I think that that's again part of this part of this push to to really stress to really stress the degree. And I mean, and I, I you know, I when I talked to to Gene, I mean, he and I had a great conversation about this too, as I was, you know, asking about these questions about. Um, these questions about sort of like the purpose of a liberal arts education, which is something that I, I mean, I think is really, for me, I think that the liberal arts education is the important piece of, of college. And, you know, we have this great conversation about when students are going into so much debt in order to get a degree, that that question, like, that's why this question of the liberal arts education goes out the door. That's why the question becomes, are we preparing students for jobs? Because when you have sixty thousand dollars in debt, you have to be pre you have to be prepared the day you graduate to get a really good job. Or at least six months later. <laughs> six months later, when your student <laughs> loans come due, right? <laughs> well, that was a great story. Okay, uh, I am really sorry that I couldn't see your talk this morning <laughs> on when you look at the, the three slides. laws of robotics. I love the slides. In fact, you used the couple that I sent you. I was delighted you to you see did. those ones, but there you were did. so many other great slides. You did. My talk went really well. I was, I was, uh, it was great, um, and it was funny because um, Dave Cormier was the keynote speaker yesterday, um, and he spoke about. Um, it, this was at a, a law, a law education, um, a law. I was going to say law IT. Who conference. at that organization? was reaching out to Dave Cormier <laughs> and to you. Well, the great thing was that people were tweeting um, with the hashtag Team Education Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> because Dave spoke about, again, I mean, this is the person that coined the term MOOC. Um, and so Dave was speaking about sort of the future of higher education and are MOOCs now learning innovations in which I think the MOOC, as he envisioned it a couple of years ago, certainly was a learning innovation. Or are they business innovations? Um, and so, what is the future? What does the future hold for universities? Um, and again, the University of Virginia stuff is well timed um, to raise these questions. What's the future for universities when schools like Stanford and Harvard and MIT are offering some of their foundational classes online for free? Um, and then I got up today and talked about. Um, automation and artificial intelligence and this drive towards efficiency and robots. And I think <laughs> the attendees' jaws were sort of on the floor <laughs> by the time we were done. But it was great. Is, did you record it? There will be a video posted in the next couple of weeks. Oh, I can't wait. It was, it was really <laughs> super. It was really super. I, I loved all of the use of 
science fiction. Well, that, that was part of my argument is that I, I mean, and of course my background is in literature, but I wanted to argue that I think that science, science fiction isn't this separate thing that has nothing to do with, with our reality, and I think that it actually very much dictates how we think about science and how we think about innovation, and I think how we think about learning, strangely and unfortunately enough too. This vision, these visions of that image actually that you shared with me of um, Captain Kirk and um, McCoy. And McCoy sort of getting the injection of Spock's brain. That was the episode, right? Spock's brain. Um, and sort of this notion that we can just fill kids' minds. In, that's the promise of EdTech. Wait, where have I seen that? Oh, waiting for Superman. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's the promise of EdTech too, that EdTech is actually going to make not, I mean, I think that this notion of filling kids' brains is something that we've long had a misconception about learning for a long time. But the promise of ed tech is it's going to make filling kids' brains even more efficient. And so um, I think that this, these, are, these are really important things that science fiction helps us think about and that reality actually, I think, is definitely reflecting. So. Well, science fiction can be a projection yep. of our sense of, of what's coming that's good or what's or, coming that's and, bad. And, and what we're experiencing today. I mean, I think that science fiction isn't always about the future. It actually, even when it purports to be about the future, it very much is about the present. I mean, this is why the first science fiction novel is Frankenstein occurs at this really interesting moment, uh, um, you know, of, at the, sort of the beginning of thinking about the scientific revolution. And I think that it's never separate. I mean, science is, nev science is never separate from culture. Scientists, I mean, last time I checked at least, are not robots, they're human. Although, give it a year or two, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they will be. I'm going to really look forward to hearing yeah. that talk. Okay, so you've just finished your, your week in EdTech yes. post uh, minutes before we got together. So I'm at a loss here. You're going to have to tell me about the big stories. Well, the big story of the week, I think, and the most important story um, that I've been tracking on, and I would say almost, almost everyone, when I, when I turn to Twitter, it's the most important story that folks in higher ed have been paying attention, is the continuing fallout from the firing of President Teresa Sullivan at the University of Virginia. So um, we mentioned this briefly, I think, last week. Um, the, the Board of Visitors um, met um, sort of a uh, unscripted meeting and, and fired a person who had been only been at the university for a couple of years, who had been a longtime academic and scholar herself, and their response was that she wasn't responding quickly enough to the technological change. And in fact, there were um, a bunch of uh, the student newspaper FOIAed some of the emails and it found that they actually were responding, unfortunately, to David Brooks op-ed about the campus tsunami and felt as though why didn't the University of Virginia have a MOOC and ha why wasn't the university um, being uh, in, the, in the eyes of the Board of Visitors who, I should note here, have no experience in education, none of whom are educators. They are all political appointees of Republican Governor Bob, Mac Bob McDonnell. Um, that that they, they decided to get rid of a person who, who I think was moving the university forward, but they didn't feel was doing so in a fashion that was responsive enough to David Brooks's op-ed pieces, which if, if we're going to use David Brooks' op-ed pieces as the, as the governing doctrine for public education in this country, I think we're in big, big trouble. But I think the University of Virginia shows we're in big, big trouble. It's so interesting. It brings out this dynamic of the, the, the resistance of change in education is that um, an autoimmune response mm -hmm. that is actually useful and helpful, or is it sometimes, obviously it can be both, also can right. be sort of dragging your feet, but it feels as though there, um, in this particular case, and in a lot of the public discussions around education, it's not around the substantive topics. It's around right. kind of the surface level Absolutely. PR side. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's what this, that's actually what this story very much feels like, is that these were a handful of people who found themselves in power, who made a decision really based on, not on experience or expertise, but on um, the most sort of superficial of assess assessments of what the future of education looks like. And I think it's worth noting, this is sort of perhaps um, an interesting footnote to the story, is that MITx finished its first MOOC, or yeah, its first MOOC um, this past week. 
and it had, I wrote down the statistics, um, it had 154,000 students registered and 7,000 successfully completed the class. So that's a 5% completion rate, um, which is dramatically less than the Stanford AI class, which has also been sort of, um, you know, ballyhooed as sort of the future of education, which had a 14% completion rate. But I think it's important to, what does it mean when, when, when universities are going to put efforts into something that only 5% of students can pass? Now you can make the argument that, well, this is great, we're making all of, this all of this resources available for free online. Anybody in the world, right, this is democratizing education. Anyone in the world can access this content. Anyone in the world can sign up. Anyone in the world can participate. And eh, if 95% if drop out, if they don't pass, it's not our responsibility because they're not paying students and we did our best to make it, we, we did our best to sort of make that stuff available for them. And I think, and I think that that's something that universities, universities really need to stop and think about. If MIT can only get a 5% completion rate, is a 5% completion rate acceptable? And I realize that we're talking hundreds of thousands of students here. But if the mission of the university is to educate, is to educate, and it's to support students' growth, then I don't think a 5% completion rate is Seems like a good figure. I'm not I even mean, sure that that figure is representative of uh, sort of the depth of conversation we'd even want to have, no. right? Well, I mean, right. who are those graduates? Right, well, right. I mean, I, and I think that all of these things, that I think that, the, you know, that if, if there were a class offered, even a class offered at MIT, I mean, that, that just seems in some ways, I don't know, I mean, perhaps I'm being dramatic, it seems negligent in some ways to sort of suggest, or it seems negligent to suggest that MOOCs these versions of MOOCs are the future of higher education if 5% of students can pass them. It feels a little bit to me like the encyclopedia salesman <laughs> who says, buy this encyclopedia set and your child's future is assured. And, and the truth <laughs> is that, you know, only a small percentage of kids actually read through the encyclopedia. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the truth of education is much more about uh, a thoughtful, concerned adult drawing a student into a new world of, of study and interest, not sitting in front of an encyclopedia. Well, and I think, I mean, and I think if universities are going to argue, well, you can put this stuff online for free and anyone can access it, but what we offer on campus is the support, then I think, again, we need to sort of ask these questions about equity and we need to ask these questions about what access really means. And, um, is that sufficient? I mean, is it really sufficient to say, oh, just go watch the video, but only if you're um, wealthy can you actually have personalized human folks who um, are there to sort of support you and mentor you and help you along the way. I mean, again, back to mythologies of higher education. Is it about access to content? Because if, if, if it's that, then well, we've done it. I mean, we have access to content, so the mission is done. Or is the mission of higher education and the meaning of higher education something else? So I want to make the case that this is actually a really, really healthy thing, meaning um, oftentimes people would come up to me at a conference and say, I wish that I could just sort of turn the switch and my superintendents and administrators would also get Web 2.0 or social media and transform everything. Robots. And, right. Well, my answer is, yeah, robots. <laughs> no, my answer has always been, you wouldn't be happy with that because what we're going through right now is a cultural negotiation. Mm -hmm. We're seeing huge changes in where information resides yeah. and our access to it, and we need to be able to talk about this. And, and in part, what you and I do every week is we're right. sort of thinking out loud. Exactly. Right? And there's this push and give and take, mm -hmm. and there's this expansion of our understanding, mm -hmm. and the sort of summary dismissal yes. of somebody because they didn't immediately adopt what is arguably not necessarily in the best interest of higher education. Well, as Dave said, it's not a learning innovation. Fascinating. Yeah. But this yeah. is good because actually that you're bringing attention to it, that others are bringing attention to it, means that we can continue to have conversations about what's really going on. I mean, clearly, there is something of value to Khan Academy and to move mm -hmm. in terms of distribution. Absolutely. But that's not the same thing as we, we both expected right. from a liberal arts education. Right. I mean, ac access to content, I'm not saying that access to content, open access and free access to content isn't important, but I don't think that that's sufficient and, and that we should say that somehow we've done our job as educators because we've sort of posted a video on YouTube. 
so that. <laughs> okay, so you have a lot of other stories here. I do have. A, I'll pick one more story. Okay, perfect. And then I think we've we've, we've crossed a long time. And uh, the the I think the other interesting piece of news this week was Microsoft's unveiling of its tablet. Um, and then I don't know if this is sort of directly um, an education story per se. And in fact, um, because Microsoft failed to sort of give a price tag or a launch date, I don't think it's going to be an education story for some time. Um, but it is interesting to see now certainly Microsoft stepping up to the plate and recognizing that um, it's going to, to create a device it's called Surface. Um, it's a tablet computer. It has this interesting, it's a bit like the iPad cover except it flips around and it's a keyboard. Um, so it's, I think uh, Microsoft recognizes that it needs to step up to the plate to challenge Apple and the iPad, um, perhaps the MacBook Air as well as this sort of low-cost device. And you know, it's, I found myself in an interesting position of finding that I want to root for Microsoft to not have this be a failure if only because I think we're going to be in a world of hurt if Apple continues to monopolize the tablet market. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, rooting for Microsoft. I know. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey, thanks for a great week of posts. Yes, and we'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Looking forward to ISTE. Yes, awesome. Thank you. Bye.